Okay, today we're going to talk about how to build networks. Some of this will seem obvious, but it's really important to think about the considerations that you have to take into account when you're putting together a network. So first you have to make some decisions. As we know, networks consist of nodes and edges, but what do those nodes represent and what do the edges represent? We need to know this before we're doing anything with the data. So for example, an exercise that I've given students before is to build a network of their friends on Facebook. So in that case, it's pretty simple. The nodes are their friends and the edges are the relationships on Facebook, the friendships on Facebook. But what if I said I wanted you to build a network of people in your classes? I've had students before include nodes that represent the classes and then that becomes a problem. What are the edges representing then? It's okay to have nodes of two types, nodes that are people and nodes that are classes, but then we need to be very clear about what the edges are. Do the edges indicate social relationships between the people? Do they connect people to the classes? Is it both? And if it's both, why are we bothering to include the class nodes? Because they're going to look really different. They'll have a pretty high degree because all the people in that class will be pointing to the node. And a lot of times if we don't think carefully about what the nodes represent and what the edges represent, we kind of throw together networks that actually don't make a lot of sense. So it's really important when you're putting a network together that you write down for yourself the nodes are this kind of thing and the edges are this kind of thing and then you always follow that throughout in your decision making. So here are some examples. As I mentioned we could have a Facebook network. The nodes could represent people but what could the edges represent? They could represent Facebook friendships, which is a perfectly fine decision, but they could represent other things. So an edge, for example, could connect two people who like the same object, or who like at least five things in common, or people who went to the same university. All of those are also fine decisions, but it's important to specify which one you want to do when you're starting off. So if you visualize this network, what are you going to see? And we ask that question to think about what are the kinds of patterns that we want to discover in the network. So for example, if you did include, say, classes and people who were in those classes, if we linked people to the classes, what sorts of patterns would we expect to see? Oftentimes, if we build a network like that, we can't see anything except that the classes have a high degree. Not a lot of other things emerge from a network that's structured like that. So, you want to think about a visualization, not because it will change the visualization necessarily, but because that can provide guidance to you about what sorts of information you're trying to get out of the analysis. Think about what patterns you want to see visually, and that may help you understand what data you need to represent. Similarly, what would network statistics mean in this network? So if you're linking people together based on their friendships, what does it mean to have a high betweenness? In that case, it means that the person is kind of a gatekeeper of information, that they really stand between different groups of people. A high degree centrality can represent people who have a lot of connections. But if you have multiple kinds of nodes, for example, people in classes, then what do those statistics mean? If you have nodes that represent both people and classes and you compute betweenness, does that betweenness actually tell you anything about the network? And if so, what? Oftentimes, with multiple types of nodes, the answer is no. So you really want to think about that. So just to talk a little bit more about networks with multiple node types, there's a term for this called bipartite graphs. A bipartite graph is a network that has two types of nodes and there's no connections between nodes of the same type. So for example, here we can see a bipartite graph that has people and organizations, but there's no links between people and no links between organizations. The only links go between people to organizations. It's also possible to have graphs with multiple node types that aren't bipartite. So for example, if we also had a network around the people, if people were connected to one another, this wouldn't be a bipartite graph because bipartite graphs mean that you can only have links between the different types. 
but it would still be a perfectly fine network. You can have nodes of multiple types. However, as I mentioned on the previous slide, you want to be really careful when you're doing that because your network statistics often fail to give you any interesting information if you have networks that have multiple node types. So let's talk about building a network. And I'd like you to follow along with uh, an example on page 120 of the book which has you think about building a network of a TV show. So think of your favorite show and I'm going to ask you to build a network of that show. Step one is going to be to define the nodes. What are they and what are the criteria for being included? So if we think about this example, a network of characters in your favorite TV show, which characters get included as nodes? Is it just the main characters? Is it extras? you know, the people walking around in the coffee shop who don't have a name? Is it people who are mentioned but never appear? Could they be a character? Is it something besides that? Generally, you'll want some mix probably between having just main characters and having all the extras. Uh, so if you think about a show like The Walking Dead, there you have sometimes hundreds of extras that represent zombies. They're not really meaningful contributors to the social network. But if we only pick main characters, we'll lose a lot of tangential characters who actually do contribute some meaning. So it's important to be very specific about the criteria that you're including. Maybe it's characters who have some dialogue. Maybe it's characters who both appear and are mentioned, but don't have to be a main character. It's important to think this through carefully to define that criteria. Once you've decided who the nodes are, the next step is to define the edges. What does an edge represent, and what's the criteria for adding one? So if we continue with that same example of a TV show, we may want to add an edge if two characters know one another. But, for example, what if they only know of one another? So what if they're characters that are in two different parts of the show, and they never interact with each other, and they never actually meet, but they do know that each other exists? This can happen a lot in, say, conspiracy shows or thriller shows, where there's a head of an organization and he knows about the people who are pursuing him, those people know about him, but they've never actually met. So those characters don't really know one another and they never interact, but their relationship could be important. At the same time, it would be a perfectly legitimate decision to leave off edges between people who don't actually interact. Again, you need to make a decision about what that edge represents. You also want to think about what kind of data might go with that edge. So for example, if you're looking at characters and you want to know something about their tie strength or their trust, how could you measure that? Maybe it's the number of words they say to each other in the show. Maybe it's the number of scenes that they appear in together. So think about what those edges represent both in terms of their existence and then also with respect to any data that you might include on them. So those are basic decisions for putting a network together. The next thing to think about is how to handle large networks. Some networks are going to be too big to analyze, and this includes networks where the decision has already been made for you about who the nodes and edges are. In this case, you might need to filter or sample the network. This also can happen if you're building your own network. So for example, if I want you to build me a Facebook network, you can't possibly build a network of all one billion people. It's too big to analyze, it's too big to visualize, and it'd be really hard for you to actually get all that data. So you need to create a sample, or if you're given a big data set, you might need to filter it down. So we're going to talk about a few ways that you might filter or sample a network. Snowball sampling is one really common way people work with social networks when they're trying to build a data set to work with. So when you're working with a large network, you choose a starting node. Uh, sometimes this is called a seed node, and there's just one node that you're going to start with. For that node, you get all of its connections, basically its egocentric network, and then you follow them to all of their connections, so that's a second degree egocentric network, and so on, and you follow that out until the network is the size that you want to work with. This is a convenient way to put together a network. It's something that, if done right, is perfectly acceptable for doing analysis. But there are some problems with it. It's biased towards the part of the network that's sampled. So if you have a really big network, you can get a good picture of part of it, but you may miss other features. 
benefits. It's really easy to do. You just pick a node and start there. And it's also a pretty common approach that people take when they're building networks to work with. Another thing that you can do is random sampling. In this case, you select a certain percentage of nodes to keep, and then you keep all the edges between those nodes. Or you randomly select a certain percentage of edges and keep all the nodes that are mentioned. There are problems with both of these. Edge sampling tends to be biased towards high degree nodes. So if you think about it, if you're randomly picking edges, there are some nodes that have a lot of edges, those hubs in the network. So if you randomly choose an edge, there's a much higher probability that it's going to be connected to one of those hubs, those high degree nodes, than a low degree node. So the network that you get as a result will look really different than the average network because you'll have these high degree nodes in there. Node sampling, on the other hand, loses some structural characteristics. So if we're randomly choosing nodes, we may actually miss out on some of the really important nodes in the network. We're also going to be missing some of the edges that come from those nodes, and so it's just not going to look the way that the network does as a whole. Again, benefits, this is something that's easy to do, and node sampling keeps some network statistical features. So you can run some network statistics if you have sampled by nodes, and then you'll have some results that you can work with statistically. A final method here is egocentric network analysis. So instead of looking at the network as a whole, we're going to look at egocentric networks of some or maybe even all of the nodes. And we're just going to analyze those egocentric networks. Now this is a different type of network analysis than analyzing the network as a whole as we have been, but it gives us a lot of information about the roles of individuals in context. We can start to see which individuals are most important, why they're important, what their networks look like, and who they're connected to. So this can be a really useful thing to do, and in fact it's the basis for some of the network analysis that we'll be talking about later on. So to have you work this out, I'm giving you an exercise. You're going to read the first chapter of Pride and Prejudice, and make me a network of the characters with their relationships. The text is available from Project Gutenberg, and I've got that linked off the lecture page for this topic. The first chapter is only a few pages, so there's not a lot of reading to do. But it turns out that this is a pretty hard exercise to do right. So if you go to the lecture page, you'll see more details on what I want from this. And that'll be our first start into really working on building networks.